Is this your first escape room that you've done? Yeah, yeah well, the first one that I've actually been to, I think I've done uh, voices mm. for the previous one because it had Cybermen in yeah. it, so I did the voices for that. But this is the first escape room that I've ever visited. My only mm. previous experience of escape, escape rooms is watching shows like The Crystal Maze, you yeah. know, which is the sort of my basis of it. Yeah. How did you find it? Well, today, doing it, uh, I was really terrible at it, yeah. <laughs> but uh, that's all part of the fun. Yeah, I mean, that's fair enough. Um, it requires a lot of natural thinking and problem solving skills that I, I clearly just don't have. <laughs> uh, yeah, I would just in general love to do questions because you know, you've probably been asked these before, but we'll go with them. It's okay, I'll make it feel like the first time. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you have a first memory of Doctor Who? Um, yeah, I have several sort of slightly confused first memories of Doctor Who. But and they are of William Hartnell as mm. the Doctor. Um, and I think it's, uh, I certainly remember quite clearly um, the Tenth Planet and those mm. particular Cybermen because I remember going around putting a, a small uh, wooden stool like my jump <laughs> to be like a Cyberman in a big <laughs> chest unit. And because they seem to have a sing songy voice, we have a tiny uh, mouth organ. You know what those little yeah, yeah. I used to put that in my mouth and they go, yeah, yeah. because they're yeah. so in my mouth, like yeah. that. You know? But I have the Celestial Toy Maker, I've got some mm. memories of that. And uh, I fancy that I had some memories of the Dalek Master Plan, the Dalek's Master Plan, but I think that's because they showed a clip of it on Blue Peter, so I'm not sure that I'm actually remembering it yeah. from seeing it when it was on, because I would have been, because I was born in 1961, mm -hmm. viewers, and uh, I. You know, yeah, so I was really quite young when Doctor Who started. So I may, there may be other, you know, if you were to do some kind of mind probe on them, you might be able to find it earlier um, memories. But since you haven't brought your mind probe, yeah, I'll have to stick on those next time. Yes, um, you voiced Daleks, Sidemen, um, Jadoon, etc. Yeah. What's the favourite? Like what you would go to? And I can ask the guest. Okay. Well, yeah. What's your guess? My guess would be Dalek. Yeah, you're absolutely yeah. right. It is the Daleks. Because, you know, they are the iconic monster. And despite the fact they're sort of stunted and evil and very unpleasant, they, they do afford quite a big vocal range. You know, you can be screaming angry, you can sometimes be sneaky and nasty. And some of the Daleks I've played are a bit sort of pathetic. And some have been almost verging on the sympathetic. Yeah. So that's quite nice. But I think one of the best things for me about the Daleks is the reaction that when I do them in a situation with other people around, the reaction that I get. People are, you know, I'm sure people like my other Doctor Who monster voices, but doing the Daleks gets, quite often gets a round of applause and a scream and a thrill. And that, that's nice for an actor to get that response because yeah. one of the reasons people become actors is because they want to communicate to people and give them thrills and give them Laughter and scare them and get an emotional response in some ways. Yeah. I think the Dalek voice fulfills that rather nicely. Absolutely. Yeah, on the topic of Daleks, mm. you've worked on a lot of Dalek stories yes. since um, Series 1. Do you have a particular favourite story that you've worked on? Um, I don't have a, a particular favourite because they all offer very different challenges, but I suppose um, the, the first one I did, Dalek because it was the first, and even though I'm always thrilled to come back and do them, it was, it was the most thrilling to work on because it was all new and exciting and I'm a massive Doctor Who fan and I got to work on brand new Doctor Who coming back for the first time in years. You know, I never thought Doctor Who would come back. I really didn't think it would come back. So for it to come back and for me to be involved was a huge thrill. So for that reason, Dalek is my favorite, but um, so many other, fantastic stories to work on. I mean, great to come back in the second one and to do lots of Daleks mm. and then Journey's End doing Dalek Calm and we yeah. yeah, that was great fun as well. I mean, I, frankly, if you just let me talk for long enough, I would end up naming all the stories and telling, <laughs> telling you I love yeah. those as well. Yeah. Do you have a particular favourite classic story that one you perhaps didn't work on, like a Dalek story? Oh, yeah. I mean, there's, I mean, uh, there's a joke with me and, you know, fellow Doctor Who fan friends of mine that so when old episodes of Doctor Who are recovered, because that's the, your, your viewers will know many Doctor Who episodes from the original series don't exist anymore. Yeah. And the joke is that when they say, well, a new episode, an old episode of Doctor Who has come back, I said, 
if it's not Evil of the Daleks, I'm not interested. <laughs> because I remember Evil of the Daleks very well, which was intended at the time to be the final ever Dalek story in Patrick Charlton. Uh, because Terry Nation, the creator of the Daleks, was allegedly going to take the Daleks off to make a TV series for more for the international, strictly American market. So he and the BBC had sort of parted company with the Daleks at that point. But I remember seeing it because it was uh, the first Doctor Who story, I think, to be repeated in its entirety. And I remember when they repeated it, uh, I remember as a youngster thinking, oh, I've seen this one before. Oh, brilliant, it's that one again. Uh, and so, yeah, uh, I suppose I have to say that's a, a favourite one of mine because I would just love to love to see it again. I mean, it sounds really over-emotional, but like when they found um, the, uh, the word of fear when that came back, um, you know, I remember so distinctly seeing it as a child. But when it came back, I thought I'd never seen it again. When it came back, it was sort of like a dead relative knocking the door and saying, hey, I'm still alive. So it was immensely emotional for me. I, I watched it very early in the morning in America when I was over there doing a Comic-Con in New York. And um, someone texted me in the middle of the night, which wasn't the middle of the night for them because they were in England, and said, are we excited about whether fear being on iTunes or not? And I thought, oh, don't wake me up in the middle of the night. And I thought, now, isn't it? So I just downloaded it from iTunes and, and thought, actually, I'm going to have to watch it, aren't I? In the early hours of the morning, and I watched it. And this is rather embarrassing to admit. I went to have a shower afterwards because I suddenly realised it was breakfast time, and I sobbed like a like a child with with um, well, with delight, with just overwhelming emotion of having had this, as it were, dead member of my family come back to life. It was fantastic. Yeah. It was. Such a very interesting story, actually. Um, goodness. <laughs> it was boring. Anyway. <laughs> but thank you for the review. <laughs> you have <laughs> to You've worked on the show again since Series 1 in 2005. Yeah, yeah. And you're still appearing and doing voices in the latest series, which do. Yeah, well. yeah. What's changed the most, do you think, from you know, back we must have been this back in you know, Christmas and series one all the way to now with Chris Chibnall and Joey Well, that's a really interesting question. I don't really know how to answer that. I mean, each each series of Doctor Who changes slightly. You know, that's in the nature of the show. It always evolves. Um, and everyone has their own personal style. And then I notice, you know, different line producers come in. I work with different directors who have different approaches. So much changes. I can't really encapsulate it in, in one answer. Um, I mean, the, the fun thing for me is that uh, the, the current showrunner, Chris Chibnall, although he's away from home an awful lot, does live just around the corner from me. <laughs> so it turns out, uh, so, you know, so close that when um, he asked me to do the voices, the, the voice of the Dalek for Resolution, yeah. uh, the, the New Year's Day special you know, every year ago, he just uh, contacted me and said, you know, why don't why you just come around for tea one afternoon? So I went out there and took some bacon tarts and we, we had a lovely time. We both knew the baker I got them from as well. You know, it wasn't Tom Baker. Um, <laughs> and, uh, so it, I suppose that's a development for me about working on the show. The, the, the uh, showrunner is in close geographical proximity to me. But, I think I've had really good working relationships with the previous two. Stephen Moffat, I would say, I know pretty well socially. Um, working on the show hasn't really changed. It's uh, it's the same methodology working on it. You know, it's um, and, I, and I've been blessed with the fact that um, the it's been the same sound recordist day um, for for ages, and um, he really understands about the Dalek voice. And, you know, all the Doctors have um, a slightly different approach, I suppose, but they're all brilliant, mm -hmm. and it's always a thrill to do a scene with them, you know. Yeah. That's fair. I've got a couple of jokey questions. Okay. That I've seen around. I'll make the answers very serious. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, if you could travel with any Doctor. Yes. Which one would you choose? Oh, as if it were real, you yeah. know. As... 
as an Ingrid Star as a Dalek. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Rattling around the TARDIS, yeah. blowing things up. Yeah, yeah. Oh, um, well, when push comes to shove, I always say that uh, my favourite Doctor is Patrick Charlton. Mm. Um, although I do love them all, I sincerely do. I think they all have brilliant things about them. But he was my Doctor that in my formative young years. And I liked the fact that he had such a reassuring nature about him. To me, Patrick Troughton is the Doctor, but in some way, shape or form, whether knowingly or not, every subsequent Doctor has in some way um, been influenced by him. He was the, the Doctor who um, became the character we recognise now. If you go back and look at the first Doctor adventures, they're quite a different kettle of fish, actually. Quite often the Doctor just wants to get back to the TARDIS and wants to go away. But Patrick Troughton's Doctor was mostly the first Doctor who explicitly said, I'm here to fight evil and put things right. You know? And uh, Doctor Who, for me, the, the, the real key to its success is for it to be scary and upsetting and quite challenging, but also to be reassuring. And I think Patrick Troughton's version of the Doctor was exactly that, because when he was scared or challenged, uh, he, he looked quite frightening. He had quite a frightening face, but then it was, it was very elastic, his face as well, and so then it would change and he would become terribly comforting and his voice would get very, very, he said, no, it's, it's all right, Zoe, you know, and he ended up. Uh, so yeah, I would, I would travel with the second Doctor. That's a brilliant answer. Um, it's a bit of a struggle, but I'm going to go for it anyway. Go, go. If you could find a Jadoon sized loaf of bread or a hundred bread sized Jadoon, which one would you go for? <laughs> <laughs> I love Christmas like this, I never know the answer. A Jadoon sized loaf of bread or a hundred bread sized Jadoon. I think. Um, I think a hundred bread sized Jadoon, they can sort of get all round you, couldn't they, and get on your back and that'd be quite yeah. a good Whereas one big one in front of you, although, you know, terrifying, a loaf of bread attacking you. Yeah. I can't believe I'm talking about a loaf of bread attacking me. But let's talk about this seriously. A loaf of bread attacking you, the size of the Jadoon, that's serious. But I think if, as long as I was armed with, um, say, some apricot jam, I could quite easily polish it off. <laughs> that's brilliant. That's uh, what we're going to finish on. I think that's it for the questions. Okay. I mean, um, could a toaster be involved? I could oh, maybe toast it, couldn't I? Oh, yeah. Giant yeah. toaster. Yeah, yeah. A sort of blowtorch or something. Yeah. I could just toast it and then hack into it. Yeah. yeah. While it's too busy going, oh, is, is the bread making a jadoo noise? I, you, just go with it. Do whatever you want with it. It's, it's what, a it a what, sort of, what sort of noise does a loaf of bread make? Oh, who? I don't know. No. Would you ever like to voice a loaf of bread? In I this certainly thing? would. Yeah. Yeah. Well, okay. Sign me up for that now. I hope you're watching Chris Chibnall. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The so always like the bread thing. monster. We, we want that loaf of bread monster. All right, anyway, that's enough for the questions. Thank you so much. Pleasure. I'm not shaking hands because of the coronavirus, so let's do it. Well, there we go. There we go. Thank you very much. Pleasure. Really appreciate it.